Whoop. All right. And I'm going to share my screen. All right. So everybody should see this. Great. All right. So we're going to round out our talk on um that we started last week and this time um, on clocks. And then um, since project four is just finished up, we're going to go into our projects um, five, six, and seven, kind of a, and that'll be like, you know, our little pathway to rounding out this class. So I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and, and get started. So last week, I had to jump into it so quickly. Um, we finished off talking about flip-flops. And I, I think these are some, some weird circuits to to really, get through just because they're not as straightforward as the previous circuits that we did. Um, and as a review, we'll kind of look at them. This is a, well, actually, so let's take a look at this right here. Um, boop, boop, boop. Yeah, okay. And as you can see, as we talked about, it's kind of in an unstable state unless you provide it like some sort of starting state. Um, so again, um, at this point, we've kind of gone over it. I've kind of given you guys an example, walked everybody through it. So I'll just take this moment to ask, um, is anybody confused or, or a little bit um, like lost theoretically uh, on the flip-flop? Would anybody like me to go over it again? OK, cool. Feel free to here. Let me throw up electric questions just in case. Yeah, but feel free to, to ask questions um, whenever. And I'll go ahead and go back because the, the main, I guess, the gist of it is I want everybody to understand um, how exactly the circuit, you know, fires from set to reset. Um, so feel free to ask to stop me anytime uh, and we can go ahead and go over it. So if everybody understands the idea of a flip flop and latch, you've basically understood the toughest circuit in this class, which is great, right? Because that's that's just about how how hard we're going to make things um, in terms of like digital logic. So that's kind of the top end of the difficulty there. Um, and I want to take this time to kind of move us forward through a, another digital logic construct because we might as well kind of take a look at it. And that is, well, okay, first of all, we do want to add that, um, I talk a little bit about flip flops and latches, right? And essentially, the difference here is that we've got a latch right here. That's the one that we talked about. Um, and a flip-flop, essentially, if you take a look at it real quick, right? So we've got this circuit and take a look at this circuit. You'll see that all we added, all we added was this this construct here to the left, right? Um, and it's really not that intimidating once we take a look at, at what exactly it does, just because here um, you see that these two AND gates are basically only allowing a signal to come through um, if this control um, is activated, right? Um, so without a positive input coming in from the control wire, you wouldn't be able to make any changes with a R and S, right? And that's neat. And the reason we, we go into this example exactly, um, specifically that is, is because we want to only allow um, R and S to uh, perform a set or reset on a schedule right at a certain time. Um, we want to sort of time that in accordance with other stuff um, that are entire circuit is doing and in this case or let me in this case we want to time that with a clock so i think this will make a lot more sense as we, as we look at some more examples but i just wanted to throw this example out there because it'll it'll kind of move us towards um the actual latch we'll be building in, in minecraft right and i want to take this moment to say that um, when you implement this in minecraft there's a much smaller way than like building out these four gates and connecting them like this you can obviously build it like this that's totally fine um but you'll find in minecraft we've got like a, you know as you've seen with the other circuits a more compact design that'll make it easier to you know build multiple of these um and we can eventually make these these sticks of memory which is pretty neat so we'll see that in um you know coming project implementations. Um, but the reason I mention a clock, right, is because we'll move on here. Uh, we'll be talking about what we're feeding into that control wire, right? And here's the idea I want everybody to think about. Um, we need a way to maintain time. That is to provide like a steady cycle 
for our circuit to periodically update memory, right? Whether it's set or reset, we want to have that happening instantaneously whenever set the set or reset signal comes in. We want that to happen, um, you know, kind of on a time. So in other words, we, we don't want to wait immediately when this R comes in, right? We don't want to instantly like flip-flop the flip-flop. We want to make sure that if R is coming in here, only at the right cycle. Um, in other words, when the control wire is on, only then will the flip-flop switch over and get reset, right? Or vice versa. Um, and that's where this idea of a clock circuit comes in, right? Simply speaking, clocks are the way to, to do just that, right? Again, really what we need a clock circuit to do is for it to produce one, and then wait a bit, then produce zero, then wait a bit, then one, then wait a bit, you know, and, and so on and so forth, right? Usually set on a timing scheme. And, and if you've, you know, uh, take a look at computers before, that's that's where the idea of a clock circuit really, really comes in, right? So if you, you know, your processor and your computer, um, that itself has a clock speed, right? And that is almost similar, like, you know, the same thing that we've got going on here. Again, your computer, based on um, the clock speed, it'll decide uh, how many, well, when to kick off its floating point operations, right? And it's measured in, in how many floating point operations it can do per, like, clock cycle, things like that. Um, so again, we're building something similar. For example, your processor is probably, like, you know, 2.4 gigahertz or something. Um, the processor that we are going to make, you know, I guess that we're creating here is probably like a hertz or some some ridiculously slow number. Um, but we'll you, you'll kind of see exactly when our clock will will move through um, operations and lines of code. So it's neat to check that out. And the good news is in Minecraft, it's ridiculously simple to produce a clock. Um, so let me show you what I'm talking about here. Now in real life, it's a little tough, right? Um, they used to pulse current through like a quartz crystal, which resulted in like um, a resonance within the quartz crystal, which was able to create a somewhat reliable clock, right? Um, and for another example of that, if anybody's like, you know, had these watches that'll say quartz movement inside, right? Um, same deal there. They just pass electrical current through a quartz crystal and that vibrates reliably and resonates. Um, and they decided to build time off of that. Uh, we decided to take the same idea and kind of just... Um, implemented in computers, right? Uh, really all we needed was a reliable way to, um, you know, literally measure time. Um, luckily, we're just kids playing Minecraft. So Mojang has made clocks much more simple for us, right? Um, so the design below is a little outdated, uh, the one that I've got here. Um, now we can just take advantage of repeaters to slow down a signal for us. So see down here how we've got like a series of not gates. Um, before in Minecraft, it used to be that these not gates would slow down the signal somewhat um, in order to kind of get us a, a decent clock pulser, right? Um, but now all we have to do is use um, just a bunch of repeaters and we can set their delay to an arbitrary amount. And um, you can see that a you know current will go around it in a circle um, like that. And that's that's essentially how it'll be, right? I think when you build it, it'll be totally self-explanatory. I think that's one of the, the easier, like, quick 10-minute projects we've got coming up. So no worries about that. I believe that's project six. Um, and that's basically what we've got for clocks, right? Now, the reason I wanted to throw this out there a little early is just because we're going to be doing it in project six. But the real, the real thing that I wanted to really go over today uh, is project five. Before we move on to that, though, anybody has any questions on clocks? Cool. Think of this as somewhat of a conceptual introduction. When we hit project six, I'll we'll go ahead and give you like a little demo of a clock. Trust me, it should be, you know, totally fine, totally simple. I consider it to be like, you know, one of the more like easily visually understandable things that we do in this class. Oh, okay. it's actually project seven. Oh, yeah. it's project seven. Oh, my bad. Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. <laughs> I flipped that. Oh, yeah, my bad. You're right, Ashwath. Yeah. All good. Okay. Yes, so when we get to project seven, we will talk a little bit about that, and that should be that should ease up on you. You also just throwing it out there. It's a it's a pretty quick project, right? So again, that was just a conceptual introduction. We will definitely go through it, right? So I will now take this moment to switch over our slides to um, our little introduction of projects five, six, and seven. So let's let's go ahead and get that started. Now I will masterfully. Zoop. Okay. Awesome. Uh, there's a button in here. Ah. Weird. Okay. All right. Um, can everybody see that? The new slides. 
Yep. Sweet. Okay, thanks. Cool. Just wanted to make sure I was sharing the screen and not just like a browser tab. Awesome. Okay. So ROM and assembly. And this is the cool part of this class. We actually made our own rudimentary Yeet programming language, right? So you, you've seen this. You've kind of talked about this, right? Um, Read-only memory is a construct that we've spoken about before. Now our job is to implement it in a neat way um, within Minecraft. So let's talk a little bit about how you all are going to be doing that um, within Project 5. All right, so we've got some announcements here. Now last year we did this structure where we released 5, 6, and 7, but it was somewhat disastrous because everybody just waited until the last week to do 5, 6, and 7. Um, but please don't do that. Uh, we'll probably go in a more sequential format this year. Um, I think Ashwin Yeah, we'll, we'll probably just release them like week by week instead of doing that. Sweet. Definitely. Because last year we found that everyone literally just waited till the last day and then um, thing, people were not happy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's like that. Yes. Um, but yeah, we'll probably just do that uh, sequentially. We've got plenty of time this semester as well. Last semester we had a weird spring break extension thing that really was a, a little bit tough to uh, to work around. So this should be all good. So uh, again, the next three lectures, since these projects get a little bit more involved, um, we'll be kind of talking about projects five, six, and seven, right? More in depth and detailed, because um, we've kind of gone over most of the conceptual stuff that we need. Like, congratulations, you all have digital logic background now, right? And then we'll talk a little bit more about how to make these involved designs in Minecraft. Okie doke. So intro and background. Um, Here's a little overview, right? Project four was due. We've built the ALU. Uh, rhymed. The brains of the operation. Um, now it's, it's due tonight. I don't want to freak anyone out. Oh, oh yes, not... my bad. Okay, yeah. sorry, <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> so project four is due. So, um, and I, I know somebody asked for an, uh, an extension to no worries. That's that's accounted for. Um, but yes, we've built the ALU. Now we need a few more things to take this from just a calculator to an actual computer, right? Because think about it, you've you've made some neat stuff that adds, uh, multiplies, um, you know, that, that's that's all neat and stuff, but we're looking for a little bit more than just a calculator, right? And that's why you're here, to go a little bit further than what 250 taught you. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. Here are a few things that I'm going to define that we need in order to turn our calculator circuit into an actual computer. Number one, ways to store programs, right? Two, ways to interpret these programs. Number three, ways to execute said programs. And number four, ways to store data for these programs while they're executing. Um, and it's neat because these are the kind of constructs that dictate how engineers put assembly together when they first produced um, the programming language, right? After, you know, things like Verilog and stuff are very um, specific to circuit design. Um, but when you're looking at just logic in general, um, you'll find that assembly uh, has solid support for you know all of these basic constructs here, um, and it really is like the the lowest level programming language. So uh, you know to move on from that, we're going to use the digital logic circuit theory that we know uh, to build circuits to address all of these these four problems, these four key problems that I've mentioned here, and that's kind of what we're going to focus on um, with the next three projects. Cool. So here's a little. Um, in fact. I think, wait, Ashwath, you mentioned that clock was project seven. Did we? Yeah, we did a weird like thing with the projects last semester so we could get through everything to the last, to the missed week. Oh, yes. Yeah, so but okay. uh, yeah, so the way that it'll work this week, uh, this year is um, project five is the ROM. Project six is the program counter. Project seven is the clock. Project eight's memory. Oh, got it. Okay, neat. Yeah, it looks like, um, oh, in fact, yeah. Oh, okay, so it looks like we're kind of um, on a similar thing. This okay, cool, cool. Does that mean um, the clock circuit would be in Project Seven? Yeah, the clock circuit is Project Seven. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, got it. All right, perfect. So I guess this is a. I, would you say this is accurate then? More or less. Uh, just. Project the store storing data would be project eight, and then there's just one mini project that takes like ten minutes in between those two. Oh, okay, cool. Yes. Oh, I figured. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yep. Oh, good. So basically, this is the schedule, everybody. Um, I would I would kind of discount project seven as a as a huge workload in the, in this case. We'll be doing five, six, seven, and eight, where seven is just a very simple clock, right? So that'll take ten minutes tops. Um, 
and and eight will be the real um, kind of random access memory that we're doing. So I guess we will be talking about the first two points um, today, which is storing and interpreting programs, right? And then we're kind of be talking about this is basically ROM that we're fixating on. Um, so here's a problem that we want to solve. Uh, and before we architect a solution, let's understand that, right? So we need a way to store our programs, and we need a way to interpret our programs. Um, so let's start with some standard questions to help guide us there, right? How exactly will we represent our programs? And how much space will we need to do that? Well, okay, here's one thing, right? Um, if you were thinking the most basic programming language, you'd probably consider something like assembly. But we know that assembly is written in text, and we can't particularly store text on our, our system. That would be ridiculous and take a lot of space. Um, so we're going to have to go for the next best thing. But I like this idea of assembly, so let's, let's work with that, right? Um, so, so far, we've designed add, subtract, multiply, and other three-bit operations. Um, and, and really, I'm just kind of trying to get you to, to guide you towards seeing that, okay, we've seen these operations, and you've probably seen them in 216 in assembly, except for, I believe, um, Brian, I don't think you've seen this yet, but I think I'm assuming Larry will get to it at some point. <laughs> um, but essentially, at a very basic level, right, um, hopefully everybody's done like x86, MIPS, y86, something like that, uh, or AVR. Um, and we've seen these basic operations like add, subtract, multiply. No worries, Brian, I would think about your math, um, yeah, your math lawn project. It's basically that. Sweet. All right. Um, so let's take a page out of the first programmer's books and say that we're going to write some stripped down, very basic version of assembly, right? Um, and for this project, we'll be working with a 14-bit version of assembly uh, created by the divine for use in CMSC 389E, uh, right? So we need 14 bits to be able to store each instruction in 389E assembly. Um, this is a great kind of think back to, um, I believe, I think Larry does this project consistently. It's uh, You basically take assembly and you, de you deconstruct it into binary um, as a set of instructions. So if you've done that project with Larry, that's exactly what we're trying to get at here. So that should be kind of like a, a quick way to understand what we're getting at. But if you haven't, no worries. We'll kind of walk you through it. Um, but I think the semester before it was called like coffee cake or something. Um, and it's called math lawn this semester. So just food for thought. Now, moving on. How much space will we need? That's a problem, right? We only have a three-bit computer. It can only do three bits of operation at once. Yet our assembly is going to take more than just three bits to store. 14 bits. Um, we're going to use a sneaky workaround to get around this issue, right? So most computers, like the one you're looking at right now, stores their program in writable memory so that they can be rewritten by the CPU. Um, but we really have no desire to rewrite our programs by the CPU. In other words, we want to be able to build our programs in using Redstone, right? Like hardwire, hard code them in and have our computer read them. Um, but we really don't want to bother building in functionality to change those programs, right? No need. So we can drop that functionality for now. So we need a way to store data larger than three bits so we can realize our grand assembly dreams. Um, and of course, remember, a computer can only manipulate three bits at once. By that, I mean, if you wanted to add a number that's four bits, you couldn't do it, right? You, uh, you simply couldn't. You had your adder, subtract, circuit, you know, multiplier, all that. Um, is limited. It has three lanes, three bits that you can run uh, computation on at once. Um, so what if we didn't need to be able to manipulate those bits, right? Would that change our size constraint? Um, and if we don't have to depend on, you know, our circuit to be able to multiply or to perform operations on all those bits at once, um, you'll find out that we're kind of good, right? Uh, we're totally fine. And that's that's kind of why we asked this question, why ROM? Um, and that's because read-only memory is excellent in this case. We can build it to be you know, as many bits as we want um, because we can kind of read through the right parts of it, right? If we don't have to change any of it, really all we need to do is be reading from it. Um, and you kind of saw an example of that that we ran through a little while ago. But we'll talk a little bit about why it's, it's such a good idea. So remember, our computer has a 3-bit architecture. We didn't pick read-only because it was optimal in this case, right? We picked it because it's the easiest to build. Think about it this way. If we were to, you know, um, store instructions in writable memory, that is three bits of memory, there isn't much instruction you'd be able to store, right? Um, here's, an, here's one example, uh, 101, right? You have three bits, that's, that's really all you're going to be able to do. In fact, there are only uh, a set amount of combinations, eight, eight in particular, 
um, that you'd be able to even create all of instructions. So long story short, we don't want only three bits um, to store all of our instructions, right? Uh, we want to go a little bit past that. So let's make it so that our computer won't ever have to manipulate the bits in our programs. And this is the kind of big idea here, right? Um, and here's the benefit and drawback of making this little workaround happen. Uh, the pro is we can store a lot more data, which is what we want. But the con is if we want to change our program, we can't use our computer to do it. We have to go in manually edit the program that our computer is running uh, in order to change the programs, right? Now, this would have been a problem if we were actually designing digital logic circuits, right? But we're not soldering things to boards here. Uh, this isn't electrical engineering. No, all we have to do is change a little bit of redstone and we'll be totally fine. So this is no problem for us, right? Um, and that's why we've opted to make this design decision, right? ROM is fine in this case because it's pretty easy for us to build. So in order to represent instruction, let's keep it as simple as possible, right? Again, think back to 260, and this is kind of where Larry was was going down with, with like his project three or something. Um, but remember, in order to store our assembly-based instructions, we need 14 bits for each instruction, right? And again, let's call 14 bits one line of instruction, right? So Here's what I'm trying to get at. In these 14 bits, we're going to find a way to use ones and zeros uh, to represent those simple assembly instructions, right? You remember like add i or you know um, out load immediate, right? Add immediate, and you usually have register one, register two, register three, that sort of stuff. Um, so don't worry too much about the registers. Really, what we need to do is figure out a way to uh, represent a programming language with just bits, right? With just ones and zeros. So again, we've kind of talked a little bit about this. I think both offerings of 216 kind of get get at this a little bit um but we need individual lines of read only memory with 14 bits in each line um and this will allow us to properly store the programs for our computer right so let's talk a little bit about that is space the reason why people use rom oh definitely not right remember most computers don't aren't just three bits of computation uh they're like you know 32 bit 64 or not even right you know but you get the idea. They're, they're going to have more than than three bits at a time, um, and they're perfectly able to store programs in ROM and RAM, right? Um, for example, some pro some computing circuits like a TI-84 will have a few programs like a boot program, maybe some key operations hard coded in ROM, right? Um, but remember, the TI-84 also allows you to program it, right? That sort of stuff will probably be stored in um, uh, a more liquid form of memory, right? Where users can change it at any time uh, as their systems are capable of manipulating more than three bits at a time. Um, but this doesn't mean ROM is totally useless, right? Again, just like I mentioned with the TI-84, some programs are better off staying in ROM rather than RAM, right? Some programs, they're designed such that you never need to edit them ever. Uh, for example, a good example is if you've restarted your computer and you hold down that F8 key or whatever it is, um, you get the BIOS, right? And that's a program that's been stored in ROM on your hardware, which is why even when you, if you screw up your operating system or you, you mess up your disks, um, it, your computer will still most likely boot into the BIOS, right? Again, that's because it's floating around in ROM. Um, similar to the TI-84, if you clear its memory, right, like you do, used to do before exams, you're still gonna get the, those persistent um, programs sitting around. Again, that's a, it's a little bit of a weird example because clearing memory in that case doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. Um, but that, that's sort of the, the idea there, right? We want some programs to stay no matter what. So the structure of our ROM is going to be pretty neat just because, you know, we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about structure already. Um, and really what I want to do is talk about storage in Minecraft in that sense, right? Um, so now that our memory has to be read-only, you know, we're kind of all set. Remember that simple read-only memory circuit we looked at? This will be even easier, um, the one that we looked at a little while ago with ROM. By eliminating the need to set and reset our memory, we don't need to, to replace all of these bits with latches, right? Uh, like we talked about earlier, because remember, latches are the only real way we can get like a 0 and 1 uh, to be set back and forth with this thing. Uh, we've reduced it down to a highly simple concept, right? In other words, a one can be as simple as a redstone torch being in a spot, and a zero can be as simple as a redstone torch not being in that spot. So does everybody get the, um, the little analog that I'm, I'm trying to produce here between this diagram and this diagram, right? Here's the overview. We want our assembly to be represented with a bunch of bits, just like this. Again, we haven't decided exactly how yet. Um, and obviously, 
uh, since we don't need to set or reset it using a circuit, we can just throw it together using redstone torches. So feel free to stop me if you've got questions. Cool, okay. Now we can figure out what each line is saying by just running some sort of redstone wire underneath these blocks, right? And as we do that, we'll pick up the output of the torches. So this, this is kind of what it'll look like in Minecraft, right? And if you run some wires underneath your redstone blocks, like a, specifically a layer below, and no worries, kind of get you through an example there. And Ashwat showed an example of this for the ROM um, section. We can totally talk over it again. But this is kind of how it'll look, right? So now we have an idea of how to write a line of our 3D9E assembly. Just to go back over and, and review, 3D9E assembly is just a bunch of ones and zeros, right? And we can represent them with one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, you know, like that. With torches for ones and nothing for zeros, right? Which is a pretty reliable system. Now forget about the actual rules of assembly for now. Let's just be pleased with the fact that we figured out how to represent a line of zeros and ones within Minecraft. So I'll kind of use this as like a, a stopping point. Does anybody have any questions as to how we did that, right? Great, okay, and again, feel free to jump in whenever. It's, you know, it's supposed to be interactive. So you're all good, just kind of throwing questions out there anytime. Um, great, so we figured that out. Uh, now here's an additional question. This is just one line. Um, so how can we represent different or multiple lines of our code, right? It turns out that's not difficult at all. Um, the answer is very simple. All we have to do is make more lines of code, right? So you can see down there below, these are just distinct different lines of code. Uh, we just have them uh, represented as different, you know, rows of blocks, right? So it's neat. You can actually see in Minecraft, you look at it this way, right? These are literally lines of code. Um, we just built them with redstone torches, uh, which is super neat if you, if you really think about it, right? Um, so that's really what we do to get multiple lines of code. Um, now let's talk about interpretation of this, right? So we've built this, right? Now we want to interpret it. So this is when we have to build some rules. First of all, though, we run into a problem at the outset. Let's say we wanted to interpret this code line by line. How can we detect what each line is telling us to do? You can see that if we just run wires under all of these, these you know, lines of code, right? We're going to run into a problem. That problem being, check it out. During all of these lines of code, right? Um, we are actually not getting any usable output right here at the bottom because all three lines are contributing towards the output here. You can see that this, even though this torch is on, and this torch is off, we're still going to have like an on coming out here, similar here, uh, and a similar case here, right? So in other words, this, this output is completely useless. So we can see right away that running wires underneath every line using a bus, just like we've you know done before, won't work at all. So here's our solution. We'll just get all the, um, well, instead of getting all the on bits at once, we're gonna try to get one line at a time, right? Um, and before we move on to that solution, just kind of think about it in your head. Like maybe consider how you would perhaps try and solve this problem, right? Just kind of like ping it around in there. So we need a way to get the data from one of these lines at a time, right? So is this perhaps reminding you of a circuit that you've built before? Um, and once again, I invite you to think of a lot of circuits where you've, you know, seen these long and said, absolutely, totally. Yeah, yeah, no, that's solid. Um, exactly. Right. We need a way to feed it in. Absolutely solid. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Excellent. Um, and that's exactly what we're getting at, right? So again, you know, different different ways to think about it, right? Um, but multiplexer and decoder in this case, right, Richard, it's sort of the same the same deal um, because we're feeding in a specific output that we want, right? Um, and we get like a decimal line for it. So you know, um, uh, in this case, um, we're basically, uh, I guess, in this case, uh, debuxing or yeah, muxing um, to get one of the um, output values so exactly um, the right school of thought there right so we would like to use a binary to decimal decoder right um, the reason we say this right is just so we can have um, you know we've got lines of programs and it turns out if you can feed our special circuit the num like the program line that you want in binary it'll go ahead um, if we can perhaps just draw a little bit of like a a little bit of a diagram here all right, let's call this the decoder, right? I'm just gonna say D, 
EC because I can't draw anymore using this pen tool. Um, and this decoder is connected to three outputs. Um, and in, we've got binary, right? Which is neat because with the decoder, we can just say stuff like, okay, well, oh God, zero, zero. Your decoder will say, oh, that's zero. I'm gonna give you this one, right? Um, but if we feed in the decoder, perhaps zero, one, right? Then it says, okay, sounds good. I'll just give you this one, right? Um, and if you feed it in one, one, if I can just, there we go. If you feed it in one, one, or whatever, I'll just, one, one, your decoder will say, okay, I'll give you this one. Um, so that's exactly what we're doing here, right? All we're doing is we're, we're giving our circuit um, some inputs in binary, and we're basically telling it, give me that particular line, right? Okay, there we go. And that's exactly what this diagram here is sort of sort of working on, right? All it does is that you get an input in binary asking for the values of a certain line of code. Um, and then that input just goes in and says, hey, okay, that's what I want. Now give me the appropriate on off bits from the line of code that I asked for, right? That's where we're getting at. So why a binary to decimal decoder though, right? Now you don't know this yet, but it's highly convenient for us to request the line number in binary. You might think, okay, why are we just giving the input in binary? Why can't we just ask specifically, you know, for one of these lines manually, right? Um, but here's the dealio. Our circuit basically says, here's the line we're currently at in binary. Can you get me the data stored for that line of code, please? That's the sort of bigger picture that we're trying to work towards, right? We want to feed this, this whole construct a line number in binary, and we want it to output um, the code for that particular line. And again, the reason we work in binary is because, think about it, right? Remember, our circuit does all of its math, all of its thinking in binary. We don't want it to be in decimal. Um, and eventually you'll see that our program counter and such is going to have to be edited, right? Added through and we'll add some like jumps and some fancy stuff. Um, so essentially our program counter, which is gonna tell us what line we're actually at, um, is going to be jumping around uh, and being edited, right? So again, that's going to be a binary number. Um, and if we get, you know, our program counter to output a binary number of what line we're at, um, we're kind of home free because then we can just feed that line number to this circuit and get the appropriate line of code um, for that line, right? So hopefully everybody kind of gets that bit. I'll take this moment to um, ask, does anybody kind of get a little confused as to why we're getting binary input for the circuit? Why we want this decoder? Solid, okay. Moving on. Now we can safely say that we know how to do two things, right? Um, first things first, our circuit, this is, this is the kind of overview here. We're getting the line number in binary, and then we're asking the circuit, can you get me the data stored in that particular line of code, please? And your circuit says, absolutely. You've given me a binary number. I'm just gonna use my decoder and send you out the appropriate line of code, right? Again, this design here, somewhat of an abstraction, you'll find um, out how to very easily turn this into a, like a, this whole construct into a circuit that actually does exactly what we want just by adding like a little bit of extra redstone. Uh, but this is the main idea, right? So we can safely say that we, do th we know how to do two things. First and foremost, we can store multiple lines of 3090 assembly code using torches and blocks, right? That's what we talked about, remember. We're basically trying to get a bunch of ones and zeros in a line, right? Specifically, 14 of them. And uh, remember, we'll we'll kind of um get to get to ask, get to why that is when we actually talk about what the programming language does. Um, and second, we can use a binary to decimal decoder to, given a line number, remember in binary, produce the line of code that is stored in our ROM, right? That is excellent news for us because now all we need is to interpret those lines of code, right? And we're home free. Think about it that way, right? So we have a, a few components that we, we we're kind of working with here, and we've kind of went over a few of those things. So let's let's go back to the very beginning, and I'd like to do I have that in the next slide? I do not. Okay, the very beginning. I just want to point out that okay. Here's what we've got so far: how to store data for those programs, right? We've done that. We figured that out. We're going to store our programs. Um, as these long strings of ones and zeros, because remember, there's no real other way to do that um, at this very low level. So we're gonna store them as long strings of ones and zeros. 
And we're going to accomplish that using, you know, uh, lines of redstone torches that'll either be there or not there, right? And again, a simple decoder based circuit will allow us to um, be access any particular line of that code that we want. So that's good news for us. And that kind of builds into the second point, ways to interpret those programs, right? Because although we haven't figured out how to mess with the actual, you know, output that we get, how to like interpret that actual assembly, um, we have figured out how to request any line of it, right? So now that we're getting any line as input, we just need to write um, some neat logic that'll decide what to do based on what line we're getting as output. So we're kind of halfway there um, in terms of interpret. So we'll talk a little bit more about that um, next class, right? Um, and again, ways to store data for the programs. That's all in the future, all in store. Um, again, we'll do five, six, seven, and eight for this. So apologies, that's a little confusing. But going back to what we we were talking about, so hopefully that's that's kind of like the big picture to what we were talking about. Right on. Okay. So finally, here's what we got so far. We ask for a line of code, and we get 14 parallel signals, right, representing 14 bits of 389e assembly. So in other words, we request this line, right? And through some decoder magic, which we talked about earlier, um, we will get this, like, you know, the, the raw inputs and output, the raw on and off for that line of code, which is exactly what we want, right? Um, so that's the, uh, the sort of way we kind of interpret the assembly, right? We kind of extract it from where it's sitting in terms of redstone torches, and we turn it into raw on and off signals, right? And we've kind of built a circuit that works and that can access any line um, about that or from our, our circuit. So how will we actually interpret these 14 parallel signals, right? Um, so what will we do with the signals that we have? Because we have them now. We have these ons and offs, right? Which is excellent. Um, but we have to, we, that begs the question, how will we actually mess with these now that we've got them? Um, and that is where our journey ends for now. The answer, I believe, should lie in the project spec for project five. Um, and you'll talk, we'll, you'll kind of explore a little bit more of that yourself, right? Um, I'll talk more about the actual work you have to do to interpret the assembly lines, um, again, using an actual circuit. Um, once we finish the rest of the pieces of the puzzle, right? Because you kind of need all the, the chunks kind of put together um, to kind of understand uh, why we're doing this, but I highly recommend you kind of go through and, and read the project spec because it's it'll essentially get you uh, the other half of the way there. Cool. Right, so that's all I had to say regarding assembly. Take this moment to um, either, if anybody's got any questions, throw them out there, or um, I'll shout if you wanted to say anything, I can just hand it over to you. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's all I had. The project spec for five should come out later today. Uh, it's going to be split into two distinct parts. One where you have to write, like, write 389 assembly. It'll be like in the form of, like, I'll give you a Java program template that you just have to fill in. And uh, if you run that, you'll be able to see if your code works. Uh, and then after that, you're going to have to put the, the torches onto your actual Minecraft world and you'll submit that world at the end. Uh, full disclaimer, actually, there's this one, like, hitch with the, um, like, the way this test, this project is tested is, when you run the test command, it will it will fail all of your tests because um, we have no way of trying to see exactly which lines of code you're you're doing. So when the when the framework runs, it's going to fail you, but only because it will fail you and then give us the lines of code that you have, and that's what will be graded. So just thought I'd put that out there. I'll put that in the spec as well. Um, but yeah, that should come out later today. Sweet. All right, but yes, that's the um the stuff for today. When will it be due? It'll be um due like every project should be due on the next couple of Fridays. It'll be like a Friday to Friday schedule. So not yeah, obviously not tonight, but maybe next next Friday. Cool. All right. Well, feel free to stick around and ask questions. Um, I'll, I'll kind of be here until 50. Uh, yeah, I'll be here until 12. I mean, if there's no one here, I'll leave. But uh, if anyone has questions on Project 4, I'll stay and take.